This is the new iPhone. 2015 being an S year, it's a lot like the old iPhone. That means it's a solid smartphone, simple yet capable. It's the phone you recommend to your friends who can't be bothered with optimizations, to parents who want something that just works, to Henry David Thoreau fans. But with a new operating system and the biggest interface upgrade in Apple's history, this year's iPhone isn't as simple as its forerunners. I'm Michael Fisher with Pocket Now. Let's find out what that added complexity brings, for better and for worse, in our iPhone 6S Plus review. Almost nothing about the design has changed since last year. The new 7000 series aluminum is more resistant to bending, and it's got a slightly rougher texture, but it's still fairly slippery compared to most phones. It's also still got last year's wide radius corners, pronounced antenna channels, and bezels that look a little chubby next to some of the latest Android phones. So while comfortable to hold, even at this larger size, it's not likely to win any beauty contests. That's objective, of course, as is whether you'll be able to tell that the 5.5-inch display is only Full HD. Hope you heard those air quotes, because for us, 401 pixels per inch is still plenty dense for a smartphone. Now, more pixels would certainly be nice, yes, but we've spent the majority of this year testing phones with super high-res displays and big batteries, and then being disappointed in their endurance. The iPhone 6 Plus is the opposite. It packs a smaller power pack than most, but it's really good at making the most of it. We've got the details in our full review at Pocket Now, but this phone lasted seven hours of grueling heavy use before giving up the ghost. The same kind of usage that torpedoed the Moto X Pure Edition in just five hours. In more typical conditions, and with the help of power saving mode, the 6S Plus got us through almost two days of moderate use without charging. For a phone this size, that's really solid endurance, and it helps make up for the fact that the iPhone has no wireless or super fast charging options like some of its competitors. That's not to say the new iPhone is without its toys. The new Touch ID fingerprint scanner is so fast, it's too fast. We almost never see our lock screen notifications and the camera shortcut is useless. So all you need to do is graze the home button to unlock the thing. The notification switch is nothing new, but it's so great to be able to silence the entire device with one click. And when you do, Apple's Taptic engine delivers a much more subtle vibration impulse. The Taptic engine also makes its presence known every time you use the new iPhone's most famous feature. 3D Touch is… well, remember the BlackBerry Storm and its awful clicking touchscreen? 3D Touch is like that, if it worked the way it was supposed to. You press a little harder on the clock, for example, and you can jump right into the stopwatch. Do it on the Evernote elephant, and you can start a new note. See how many messages are waiting from your VIP contacts. Instantly start shazamming a song. See what your next calendar appointment is. This is the kind of stuff you don't immediately get, and it's easy to forget the function is there unless you're constantly using it. But the first time you peek into an email and then pop into the full version, or do the same with a link in the browser, or reposition your cursor in a text field, you get it. It's not mind-blowing or anything, but it is a very clever means of extracting more usefulness from a touchscreen, and it's only going to get better as more developers start embracing it for their applications. The rest of Apple's new OS is a largely positive experience, with some new and old frustrations mixed in. iOS 9 brings a new multitasking screen that makes it easy to shuffle between apps and even with only 2 gigs of RAM, we didn't often find ourselves waiting for apps to reload from idle. The reachability is still here to make stretching to the top of the screen a little easier if you're trying to use this big phone one-handed, and Spotlight Search is the easiest way to find or do basically everything on the phone. The new proactive panel on the leftmost home screen is pretty good at delivering contextually relevant shortcuts and information. And it's strange that Apple is the only big software maker to embrace a swipe up from the bottom control panel. It's so convenient that every large phone should include it. But it doesn't include notifications. For those, you need to head up to the top of the screen, which is just as annoying here as on every other large smartphone, reachability or no. Notification Center is much improved these days, but alerts are duplicated via badges on the immortal springboard. 
So if you have a lot of spam sitting unread in some of your email folders, get ready to see this all the time. Unless you want to manually tell iOS which apps do and don't get badges. As for the springboard itself, that grid of icons and folders is just as inflexible as it's been for nearly a decade. You can change your wallpaper and move stuff around, and that's about it. Voice dictation works really wonderfully, until it stops working for no good reason. Safari is pretty quick at loading pages, but it's got some really confusing interface quirks that make it frustrating to use. The list goes on. iOS 9 is really cool. There's much more than we can cover in this video, but like many new releases, it needs some refinement. The iPhone has made a name for itself in photography, mainly thanks to a combination of solid optics and dead simple software. This phone is no different in that regard. The most attention by far has gone to live photos, which are basically, well, they're short videos, but Apple would prefer you didn't call them that. They add a little life to the gallery. You can animate them with a 3D touch or even set one as your wallpaper, which is very cool. Is it worth the slew of video files in your photo exports and the storage penalty? Yeah, probably, unless you get that 16 gig iPhone, which you shouldn't. More conventional photos look quite nice, courtesy of the new 12 megapixel camera hardware, and the combination of digital and optical stabilization on the 6S Plus makes for smooth video even when on walkabout, a video which you can then edit right on the phone in iMovie. The stills seem a bit underexposed on the whole, but low-light photos are actually pretty good, with or without the color-correcting dual LED flash. The selfie shooter got the more significant update by far. It's now 5 megapixels and it's augmented by a clever display-based flash that adjusts its color temperature based on the ambient lighting of a scene. That's cool, but it's a shame Apple once again failed to include a wide-angle lens. As good as the iPhone is, its competitors have really stepped up their output quality this year, with contenders from Samsung and LG in particular sometimes taking better photos than the iPhone. So it'll be interesting to see what Apple brings to the table next year. For now, the iPhone 6S Plus camera experience is pretty tight. Apple just needs to come up with a different way to launch it faster thanks to that too-quick fingerprint sensor. May we suggest a double-click of the home button? Oh, right. No, we can't. That shortcut is already claimed by multitasking when the phone's awake and Apple Pay when it's asleep. That's part of the added complexity we mentioned in the opening. It's tough to get used to a shortcut when it's not consistent. But you know what? It's so worth it. Because Apple Pay is so fast. And its ubiquity, at least in cities like Boston, is a striking reminder that ecosystem is about more than apps. And when you buy into Apple, you buy into a big ecosystem that's ahead of the pack in some ways. In others, Apple's just now catching up. The new motion coprocessor gives the phone more contextual awareness, letting you do things like summon Siri hands-free using just your voice. But there's no automatic activation of the display when you take the phone from a pocket, nor any of the more advanced stuff Motorola's been doing for years. Reception doesn't seem as good as some other devices in our inventory, either. And finally, there are precious few large-screen optimizations here. There's none of the split-screen multitasking, as we see on the Galaxy Note or the iPad. There's not even a persistent number row on the default keyboard, as on so many other phones. Apple relies on a dual-pane interface in some apps to maximize screen real estate, and that's fine. iOS shouldn't be like other platforms, it should do its own thing. But Apple's conservative evolution of features on its plus-sized iPhone continues to make it feel, to us, like little more than a scaled-up version of the original. We think there's some unused potential here. And yet, a scaled-up version of something great is still great. And as it enters its ninth generation, the iPhone remains a great smartphone. Its challenges, a steeper learning curve, less elegant software, and a year-old hardware design, are counterbalanced by great battery life, a deep ecosystem of apps and services, 3D touch, and a solid camera. The iPhone 6S Plus isn't the most exciting smartphone of 2015, not by a long shot, but it wasn't meant to be either. It was meant to be the best oversized iPhone yet, and this phone delivers. There's much more detail in our full review, folks. Check it out at pocketnow.com, where you can also find our full review of the iPhone 6S Minus. 
and follow us on social media at Pocket Now. Till next time, I'm Michael Fisher, Captain Two Phones on Twitter, reminding you to keep your photos live and your battery charged. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.